Welcome to the interview on France 24. Today, our guest is Howard French. He's just written a book called China's Second Continent, published by Alfred A. Knopf. The book looks into the reasons why so many uh, Chinese people have, these last two decades, emigrated to Africa. Uh, Howard French is an associate professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. He's also a former bureau chief for the New York Times, both in Africa and in China. And he joins us now from New York. Hello, Mr. French. Hello. First of all, can you tell us why, towards the end of the 1990s, uh, so many Chinese people started to emigrate to Africa? This happened because the Chinese um, government began to reevaluate its economic policies beginning in the early 1990s. It had had, had great success up until that point um, through a kind of investment policy that sought to create light manufacturing in lots of special economic zones around China by drawing on foreign investment. But it concluded in the early 90s that it could only get so far economically with this approach and that to take the country further, China had to look for new markets overseas and had to become an investor itself. This led to China becoming involved in lots of construction projects in Africa. The, the Chinese state declared in 1995 or 96 that Africa should be its priority for this kind of activity, and it, it pursued this kind of um, construction approach very aggressively over the next decade or so. This led to large numbers of Chinese workers moving to Africa to complete infrastructure projects. These could be ports or railroads or, or, or uh, airports or, or stadiums or things like that. And at the end of the contracts of these workers, a certain percentage of them would remain in China. I'm sorry, would remain in Africa. And, and, and so this was the sort of first wave of, of uh, large-scale Chinese, recent large-scale Chinese immigration to Africa. Indeed, many people believe that most of the Chinese in Africa are there with projects linked to the Chinese government. But in your book, you show that, in fact, there are many individuals who've come simply to make money. And they tell you that they've uh, fled uh, things such as corruption, uh, pollution, uh, a lack of political freedom. Would you say that today, in fact, there are more individuals uh, cases like this in China or more people linked to government projects? So the simple answer is that the, the grand, vast majority of the Chinese in Africa today can, can only be understood as private citizens. Even the ones who went to Africa originally for these state projects, if they remain behind in Africa after the end of their contracts, they become private citizens again. But a larger second wave happened, and that is as news of the success of many of the people in this first wave began to travel back to China, their friends, their neighbors, their relatives, uh, word of mouth, all of these things began to encourage other Chinese people who would never have otherwise thought about Africa to go to Africa to look for business. And so these people begin arriving by the tens of thousands and ultimately a million or more. And as you said, uh, yes, uh, the general impression one gets talking to them arriving in Africa is one surprisingly for some of great freedom. Uh, they don't feel uh, a repressive government chasing or following them around or snooping on them too much. And even uh, you one hears quite often that they don't feel the weight of corruption as much in their daily lives in Africa often as they did in China. In your book, you explain how the Chinese government in many African countries uh, builds uh, hospital roads, infrastructure, and in exchange gets access to natural resources and even land. You explain how the Chinese are very interested in the fertile land in Mali along the uh, river Niger. Uh, do you think that this is a worrying phenomenon for African citizens? So these resource for infrastructure swaps, as they're often called, are worrying because, well, for a couple of reasons. One of them is because they are usually done in a very trans untransparent and uncompetitive way. They're negotiated uh, between the Chinese uh, uh, state banks uh, uh, and uh, African heads of state or people very close to African heads of state, most typically. Uh, and the terms are not open and the bidding is not competitive because it's not an open process. You have usually a pre-selected number of Chinese companies and the parameters of the, the package are defined in China and presented more or less secretively to the African party, which makes a decision. The second reason why this is, 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 prop, is, 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 is perhaps concerning is that um, when you are making a, a barter-like arrangement for this rather than doing something in the marketplace, um, you're taking a huge risk in terms of the, the, the long-term value of the commodity that you are trading for. 
you know, you don't really know what the price of iron is going to be or the price of uranium or bauxite or, uh, or what have you 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, and the Chinese uh, are, are in more often than not are probably lo locking in a really good uh, uh, price for themselves uh, and a price that you could have done better uh, than had you uh, simply uh, negotiated things according to, to the market. You also explain in your book that one of the reasons that the Chinese are there in Africa is that they've understood that the, the African economy is booming, that the, many of the world's consumers tomorrow will be in Africa. Do you think that the Chinese have understood this better than Western nations? And is that how you read the US-Africa summit last month organized by Barack Obama? Is he trying to catch up on China in Africa? There's no question that the Chinese have understood the future potential of Africa much better and much more quickly than, than, than the West in general and the United States in particular. And to answer your question, yes, part of the um, incentive for the, behind this Barack Obama summit was a, a game of catch-up. Uh, today, Sub-Saharan Africa has more middle-class people than India does. Everyone knows or most people know that India is, after China, the next big, fast-growing major economy that's going to emerge as a, as a real power in the world over the, the remainder of this century. Few people know that Africa has more middle-class people than, than, than India. Africa's population will double between now and the middle of the century. There will be two billion people then. By the end of the century, there could be three or perhaps some say even four billion Africans by then. This won't only create good situations. There will be disasters in Africa. There will be hard, uh, hardship and failed countries. But there will also be a, an incredible growth of wealth in lots of countries with a huge expansion of the middle class. And the Chinese have understood that this, even more than natural resources, is a basis for serious, sustained attention to Africa. For this book, you, you went to many countries, to, to name a few, Senegal, Mali, Ghana, Zambia, Mozambique. What was the reaction uh, of the people you met there t towards this massive uh, Chinese immigration? Well, you know, the most remarkable thing really is that there have been very few incidents surrounding Chinese immigration to Africa. China, Ch African, Im I'm sorry, Chinese immigration has only re risen to the level of a sort of uh, top drawer political issue in one country that I know of, and th that is Zambia, where it became a major, a couple of times, it became a major issue in presidential elections. Perhaps this is be beginning to happen in a few other places. I would cite Ghana perhaps as one of them. But in general, this has been – this has gone very smoothly. There have been no real anti-Chinese riots anywhere. Um, and although there's resentment in lots of places about Chinese involvement in particular sectors or the concentration of Chinese people in particular regions, overall I have to say that uh, the African reception has been surprisingly smooth and even friendly. Many of the Chinese people you interview in this book uh, make racist comments. Uh, how do you interpret this? How widespread is it? Well, um, it's very widespread. Uh, I didn't cherry pick my examples. These racist comments that I heard came from almost all of the Chinese that uh, I spoke with, uh, and they were made, you know, in one degree of rawness or another. Um, in fairness to the subject, though, I don't think that the Chinese have any monopoly on racism uh, and that one can hear racist comments about Africans from people of all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, and so this has to be put a little bit in perspective. And I think a big driver uh, of, of this initial sort of crude kind of racism that one has heard in this first decade or so of very large Chinese migration to Africa is, is a result really of, um, you know, when you're unfamiliar with other – with, with people who you're coming in contact with for the first time, most of your thoughts about them, most of your feelings about them are driven by stereotype. And so I think that that is a real important reason for a lot of this phenomenon. One of the Chinese diplomats you meet in, in the book, you say that he's very arrogant and he reminds you of uh, what you've read about uh, American diplomats in the 50s and 60s in developing countries. And you write that there is now a Chinese paternalism. How would you define this Chinese paternalism? Well, so there's a kind of Chinese hubris that one sees in general in Chinese foreign policy and in, in Chinese feeling about – among even the Chinese population about the country's destiny. Uh, after the 2008 financial crisis in the West, um, uh, you know, there was a great exuberance in China about over surpassing the West and becoming the next great uh, power in the world. 
then uh, the following year, China surpassed Japan as the number two economy uh, in the world. And of course, everyone projects that China before too long will surpass the United States as the number one economy in the world. Um, all of this has fed a kind of triumphalism in China, which may perhaps be a bit pre premature. The biggest problem in terms of uh, this paternalism that you are asking about, though, is that um, Africans and others who encounter Chinese who express this kind of feeling can sense the hubris themselves. You know, when Chinese go around talking about win-win, which is one of the favorite terms of Chinese diplomats and even of, even of Chinese business people in Africa, um, this has begun to strike a kind of cynical response in the, their audiences, the African audiences who, especially in civil society, understand that lots of the Chinese business deals that um, the Chinese side cite as examples of win-win are being struck in very uh, murky circumstances with governments in Africa that are often unpopular and thought to be highly corrupt. And so uh, it's not because China believes its own rhetoric necessarily that other people are going to believe and accept and certainly admire its rhetoric. Howard French, thank you very much. So let me remind the viewers that your book is called China's Second Continent. It's published by Alfred A. Knopf. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to France 24.